There are several ways to treat a proximal ureteric stone of less than 1.5 cm. Extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy belongs to the first line treatment because it is simple to perform and does not necessitate general anesthesia. However, many stones are resistant to shock waves and there are also contraindications like anticoagulant therapy, obesity, or strongly impacted stones. In addition, renal colic often necessitates emergency double J stenting. In such circumstances, endoscopic removal of the stone is a rational choice. Usually, it is possible to reach a proximal ureteric stone with semi-rigid ureteroscopes, especially with the miniaturized ones. Unfortunately, access to stone is not always possible on an unprepared ureter. Furthermore, the use of semi-rigid ureteroscopy comprises the risk of flushing the stone into the renal cavities. In these situations, flexible ureteroscopy is the optimal therapeutic option. This technology has undergone a tremendous evolution recently. To illustrate the different generations of flexible ureteroscopes, we present three Olympus devices. The URF P5 has an 8.4 French shaft diameter. Flexion reaches 270 degrees, but deflection only 180 degrees. In addition, the shaft is rather flexible. This lack of stiffness might make progression into the ureter somewhat more difficult. This ureteroscope offers a fiber optic vision. More recently, a smaller fiber optic ureteroscope has become available, the URF P6. It has less than 8 French shaft diameter, comparable to the caliber of a standard ureteric catheter. The stiffness of this instrument allows easier introduction and progression inside the ureter. Flexion deflection is of 270 degrees. However, nowadays the best visual quality can be obtained with the digital ureteroscopes. The URF-V has been recently replaced by the URF-V2. The diameter of the shaft passed from 9.9 .9 French to 8.4 French. However, the caliber of the working channel stayed identical. This guarantees a better irrigation while avoiding access-related ureteric injury. The URF V2 is also fairly stiff, facilitating progression into the ureter. Flexion deflection is of 270 degrees. This ureteroscope also has a control ring near the handpiece, which allows rotating the tip of the instrument 120 degrees to the right and also to the left direction. This feature completes the rotation obtained by classical pronation and the supination of the surgeon's hand. During a flexible ureteroscopy, there are two ways to negotiate the ureter with or without access sheath. If the ureter is unprepared and narrow, it is possible to progress with the ureteroscope over a guide wire. Two guide wires are inserted by the help of a cystoscope or with a dual lumen ureteric catheter. The safety guide wire is attached to the isolation draping. Then the second guide wire is backloaded into the working channel of the ureteroscope. Care should be taken not to hold the ureteroscope with its working channel towards the 6 o'clock position, otherwise its tip will be blocked at the upper limb of the ureteric orifice. After 180 degree rotation of the ureteroscope, the working channel is in the 12 o'clock position, which helps to negotiate the ureteric orifice more easily. The ureteroscope is introduced under fluoroscopic control. The guide wire is removed and the valve is attached to the side port of the ureteroscope. 
The use of a ureteral excess sheath has many advantages. It helps maintaining low pressure in the urinary tract and facilitating re-entry. Several manufacturers have elaborated excess sheaths that require only one guide wire. However, traditional 12-14 French excess sheaths may be responsible for some degree of ureteric trauma necessitating prolonged double J stenting postoperatively. Newer 10-12 French excess sheaths are usually not harmful to the ureter. Irrigation is the condition of good visibility. However, care should be taken not to generate high pressure peaks. Several methods have been proposed. Simple gravity, peristaltic pumps, or, on demand, manual pressure irrigation. High pressure may be responsible for infectious complications, rupture of the collecting system, and retropulsion of the stone. The method of choice for fragmentation is the use of laser. Laser fibers transmit energy without loss to the stone, and they are highly flexible. Care should be taken not to burn the ureter, so fragmentation should begin in the center of the stone. Many arguments support the benefits of small 200 micrometer fibers because they produce less retropulsion, allow maintaining a good irrigation, and preserve the flexibility of the ureteroscope. With a 200 micrometer fiber, the maximal power is of 15 watts. In order to avoid retropulsion, we can use the dusting method, which requires low energy, for example 0.5 joules, and high frequency, such as 30 Hz, associated to long pulse duration. The sand resulting from dusting is well seen at the extremity of the axis sheath. For harder stones, we need to increase the energy to 1 joule or more while decreasing the frequency to 15 Hz or 10 Hz. Occasionally, retropulsion of the stone may occur. In this case, the flexible ureteroscope is able to follow the stone in the pelvic aliceal system and reach it without any difficulty. The stone can be further fragmented in situ or removed with a basket. Several baskets are available for extraction of stone debris. In this example, we employ an open-ended basket, which is easy to use. In our hands, it simplifies removal of the fragments and diminishes the operative time. At the end of the procedure, the ureter is carefully inspected. Depending on the duration of the procedure, and the degree of possible ureteric trauma, a ureteric catheter or a double J stent may be inserted if necessary. In conclusion, flexible ureteroscopy valuably completes the traditional surgical tools for the treatment of upper ureteric stones. Miniaturization, better optical resolution, and progress in laser technology make this technique more and more attractive in daily routine.